You're listening to the N2K Space Network. Our friends at the Beyond Earth Institute are hosting their annual symposium in Washington, D.C. on November 1st and 2nd. The theme this year is Leo to Lunar to Living Beyond Earth. You can join senior leaders from across industry, government, and the international community to examine the policy challenges impacting the rapidly evolving space ecosystem. Leaders like Michelle Hanlon, Lieutenant General John Shaw, Frank White, and more. Register for the event at beyondearthsymposium.org or space.n2k.com slash beyondearth. We hope to see you there. Now, this is a pretty American thing to say, but like peanut butter and chocolate, some things are just a lot better together, like cybersecurity and space, for example. Now, you add a little sprinkle of flavor, make that zero-trust cybersecurity with your space, and now, well, I'm kind of hungry now. T-minus 20 seconds to LOS, T-dress, go for the floor. Today is September 27th, 2023. Happy 25th birthday to Google. I'm Maria Varmazis, and this is T-Minus. U.S. Space Systems Command gives cybersecurity contract to SAGE, Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, to evaluate the software and cybersecurity of ground systems being developed for a new classified satellite network. Frank Rubio returns to Earth after a record-breaking year in space. And our guest today is scientist Alan Stern, the principal investigator for NASA's New Horizons mission on continuing his research and his upcoming suborbital flights. You don't want to miss it. Now on to our intelligence briefing. The Space Force Space Systems Command has awarded cybersecurity firm Sage Security a $17 million contract to secure the SSC's ground and space architectures. Sage's announcement about the deal said a big part of their being picked for this contract was their zero-trust access control and data protection capabilities for current and next-generation terrestrial-based systems as well as space systems. And that phrase, zero trust, is red-hot in cybersecurity circles and especially for federal agencies. As the name implies, this means an asset is never trusted within the organization. It has to re-authenticate, reauthorize, and continuously validate itself. In other words, it has to prove it is who it says it is and that it has permission to access what it's trying to access. And it's not hard to imagine why this is something that the Space Force is particularly keen to implement with its space assets and infrastructure. And another recipient of a Space Force Space Systems Command contract is Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, also known as APL. APL has been selected to evaluate the software and cybersecurity of ground systems being developed for a new classified satellite network. Under the $10 million contract, APL will assess the ground systems of the Evolved Strategic SATCOM Ground Segment, or ESS, and those ESS ground systems are also known as Ground Resilient Integration and Framework for Operational Nuclear Command Control and Communications, or GRIFFIN. As the government partner for independent software testing, APL will enable ESS to mitigate ground integration risks. U.S. defense and space technology company Blue Halo held a demonstration of its multi-band deployable ground terminal that enables resilient satellite communication. The demonstration of the system known as Badger comes one year into development of the $1.4 billion Satellite Communication Augmentation Resource Program known as SCAR. SCAR was announced by the Space Rapid Capabilities Office in May of 2022. 
The company demonstrated target tracking and processing of signals using multiband software-defined antenna tiles deployed on its Badger product. The successful communication and data transfer validated Blue Halo and Space RCO's progress towards delivering updates to U.S. satellite command and control capabilities. It's been a record-breaking year for Frank Rubio. The NASA astronaut finally made it back to terra firma alongside two Russian cosmonauts after accidentally setting the record for the longest space mission by an American. So how does one accidentally set a new record? Well, he can thank Space Junk for his success. Rubio set out on a 180-day mission to the International Space Station, but after his return capsule was hit by space debris... That mission was extended to a 371-day stay in orbit. The three crew members returned to Earth in a Soyuz capsule that touched down in a remote area of Kazakhstan. Command of the ISS was passed over to ESA astronaut Andreas Mogensen earlier this week, who said to the crew, No one deserves to go home to their families more than you. After circling the Earth nearly 6,000 times during their mission, nobody can argue with that, Andreas. The cavalry has arrived in Florida. After an eight-state tour via rail, the 10 booster motor segments for NASA's Space Launch System, also known as SLS, rocket, arrived at the agency's Kennedy Space Center yesterday. They will form the SLS rocket's twin five-segment solid rocket boosters. The motors produce more than 75% of the total thrust at liftoff to send NASA's Artemis missions to the moon. Teams with NASA's Exploration Ground Systems program now are preparing to process each of the segments at the Space Center's Rotation, Processing, and Surge facility ahead of integrating them inside the Vehicle Assembly Building. The U.S. Office of Space Commerce and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, also known as NOAA, has put out a request for information for the on-ramping of additional vendors to the Radio Occultation Data Buy 2 Multiple Award Vendor Indefinite Delivery Indefinite Quantity Pool. Ooh, that's a mouthful. Contracts have already been awarded to Planet IQ and to Spire Global Subsidiary. These contracts have a total maximum value of $60 million and have a five-year ordering period. More details can be found in the selected reading section of our show notes. The UK's National Physical Lab has signed a Memorandum of Understanding with OneWeb to work together on position timing and navigation, or PNT, capabilities. The agreement extends to OneWeb's second-generation satellite constellation. The UK's National Physical Lab sets and maintains physical standards for British industry. The MOU also says that organizations will look at opportunities for OneWeb to access a service node from NPL's National Timing Center program. The program is looking to develop the UK's first nationally distributed time infrastructure, which would help the country move away from reliance on Europe's Galileo global navigation satellite system, which they are excluded from fully accessing following Brexit. And China launched a new remote sensing satellite this morning. The satellite known as Yaogan 3304 was launched on a Long March 4C carrier rocket from the Juchuan Satellite Launch Center. China says the satellite will be used for scientific experiments, land resource surveys, agricultural product yield estimation, and disaster prevention and relief. That concludes our briefing for today, but you can find links to further reading on all the stories we've mentioned in our show notes. And as always, we've included a few extra for you. One from the Financial Times on sustainable insurance for space, and another on VCs looking to countries such as India for their next investment in space. They're all at space.n2k.com and just click on this episode. Hey, T-Minus crew. If you find this podcast useful, please do us a favor and share a five-star rating and a short review in your favorite podcast app. It'll help other space professionals like you to find the show and join the T-Minus crew. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it.
Introducing the latest smartphone with a new design, a new charger, and a virtually unchanged voice assistant. Ugh, they said I was the voice of innovation, but I'm disillusioned with their idea of innovation. That's why I'm telling you to buy professionally refurbished tech from Backmarket and get the same quality devices with the same old me for way less. Shop now on backmarket.com. Our guest today is scientist Alan Stern, who's the principal investigator for NASA's New Horizons. And we started off our discussion with the scope and update for the mission. Yeah, the New Horizons spacecraft is um, healthy and uh, operating every day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. We do different kinds of things, but we only do things that New Horizons can do. We study the sun's outer heliosphere. We study the Kuiper belt and objects in it. And we do some studies of the galaxy and the cosmos and astrophysics that can't be done from the inner solar system and require a spacecraft that's very far out. There was a petition that just ended pretty recently about about over 7,000 signatures from people from all all corners, really, concerned about the the potential path forward for New Horizons. What's your view on that? And maybe could you outline what some potential paths forward are? Yeah, well, as background, uh, all NASA missions that are um, past their prime target and in extended mission, as we are, um, turn in proposals every three years to NASA for continued funding and support. And we did that in uh, January of 2022, along with all of the other extended missions that study our solar system. We got very good marks. I was very happy with the review. There were 23 major strengths cited about our science, our productivity, our team, our diversity, et cetera. As I said, almost two dozen strengths. There was one scientific weakness. It had to do with one very narrow portion of the science that we do with Kuiper Belt Objects something called light curves. Uh, Without getting too far in the weeds, NASA has decided to cut off funding for New Horizons, despite that good report, um, a year from now, at the end of September 2024. We've asked NASA to reconsider as a project. We think that uh, uh, it's a mistake for a number of reasons, including the fact that we got a good senior review, but more so, uh, New Horizons costs the U.S. taxpayer almost a billion dollars. It's the first spacecraft ever sent to explore the Kuiper Belt, and it seems unwise to truncate the mission while it's still in the Kuiper Belt. That's what it was sent to do. Uh, And we're going to be in the Kuiper Belt for several more years, and then we'll pass beyond it. And that's a different matter at that point. Yeah, I am aware of that petition. It was not organized by our team, uh, but the National Space Society and several other space organizations and uh, they were very pleasantly surprised from what I've heard that they didn't expect very many people would um, care enough to click on a petition one way or the other. And they had uh, thousands and thousands of people um, asked to support, asked NASA to reconsider and uh, register their support for the mission. We're very happy with that, obviously. But uh, I don't know what uh, NASA's status is. Um, I do know that um, separately that 25 space leaders signed a letter also asking NASA to reconsider and uh, to continue the exploration of the Kuiper Belt with New Horizons people, like former chief scientists and deputy administrators and heads of planetary science at NASA and other leaders. And that's also in NASA's hands. And they have heard from advisory groups to NASA um, that have also spoken for New Horizons. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that uh, the exploration of the Kuiper Belt that we were built and sent to do is going to continue. But so far, we haven't heard definitively about that. If the news ends up being good, uh, and I know this is totally conjecture, but um, what do we hope to learn? Should New Horizons continue? What kind of Kuiper Belt objects, discoveries are we maybe hoping to find out? Oh, that's a great question. So um, uh, we've been in the Kuiper Belt now for a number of years. It's a vast structure, much larger than the inner solar system or even the middle solar system. And uh, in total, we'll be in the Kuiper Belt for about 10 years. We're about halfway through it, a little past that. And as we go farther and farther out, we study Kuiper Belt objects that are farther and farther out. And they have different properties than the ones that are closer to the sun. The only studies that we make of them are ones that you cannot do from the Earth or from James Webb or from the Hubble. They require a spacecraft up close in the Kuiper Belt, looking at these objects from different angles or studying them from very close. So far, we have studied 37 Kuiper Belt objects, uh, which we're really happy with. One 
called Ericoth, we flew right up to and got detailed geology and uh, important information about how it was formed. For the other 36, that's to place that one in context and to learn more about the Kuiper belt in general. Um, we've been learning about um, their shapes that relate to how they're formed. We learn about their rotation periods. We learn about their surface properties their, and the satellites that they have. And we do it in ways that you just can't from the Earth or from Earth orbit. Uh, and so we want to expand that number um, studying the really distant Kuiper belt objects. In fact, we now know of Kuiper belt objects that New Horizons will be able to study all the way out across the 2020s, specific ones that we have discovered along our path, just waiting for us. But that requires NASA to fund the mission. I understand. All right, I'm going to completely change gears now because a lot of our listeners were very interested in suborbital and commercial space. Uh, I know this is an area that you are very passionate about as well with a planned suborbital flight with Virgin Galactic. I, I would love to know, I know you're going to be overseeing two experiments while aboard. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'm very bullish on uh, suborbital experimentation because it's much lower cost and much more frequent than the opportunities to do things in orbit. And uh, uh, suborbital, to me, is a little bit like the minor leagues in baseball. It's used for uh, the development of players and for um, uh, people to try out new things, new techniques, because it's uh, more frequent and uh, less expensive. Suborbital works great for that. And there are all kinds of different suborbital options. There are NASA sounding rockets, and there are commercial vehicles like Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic, and there are balloons, and the list goes on. I was selected in 2020 by NASA to fly an astronomy experiment and a space physiology experiment on a Virgin Galactic mission. That's going to be in the future after Virgin has flown enough flights that NASA can clear, uh, can clear that. They want to get a longer track record. But in the nearer future, I'm going to be flying a training flight to get some practice so that when I fly for NASA, I'm not going to be a rookie. And I'm really looking forward to both of those flights to space, expecting that the uh, NASA flight is going to tell us a lot about how good Virgin Galactic spaceship is for doing astronomy, which is very exciting. That is really exciting. I mean, studying planetary sciences and then also getting to go to suborbital space, that's, that's pretty fantastic. Can you tell us a little bit about the work that you'll, you're planning on doing uh, on, during the flights? Yeah, absolutely. So on the first flight, I'm, I'm mostly going to be practicing, getting around the cabin, stabilizing myself with a mock-up of the camera that we use on the NASA flight, and trying to work out the timing details. Because... On these suborbital flights, you don't have much time. It's literally only a matter of minutes that you're up at the top at high altitude. And so the time pressure is, is uh, extreme. So the, the training flight is actually being paid for by Southwest Research Institute. That's my employer through an internal research program. And then on the NASA flight, we're going to be using an experiment that I put together and was principal investigator of. They flew on the space shuttle a number of times to look at the same star fields um, with the same camera, but through Virgin Galactic's windows instead of the NASA space shuttle windows to compare how well Virgin Galactic's windows perform. In, in flight with all the little tiny details of glints off the wing and scratches on the window that just come from the uh, rocket motor exhaust and things like that, we're going to really find out how well it can do. And I'm really looking forward to that because it could open up a lot of possibilities for doing a lot of innovative, low-cost experimentation by ourselves, but also by a lot of other people who today fly uh, more expensive systems. And this is a way that we might be able to get costs down pretty dramatically so we can do more experimentation for the same amount of money. We'll be right back. Welcome back. And we've got a closing story today for all our philatelists, though undoubtedly many postage stamp enthusiasts in the United States at least might already know this one. But the U.S. Postal Office is celebrating the successful delivery of a package by a different federal agency. The Postal Service recently announced that NASA's OSIRIS-REx asteroid sample return mission from Bennu is getting its own commemorative stamp. This incredible mission, which hopes to help us understand where life originated, how our planet formed, and why Earth can support life, is now also on a tiny sticker that you can affix to an envelope that will let you send first-class mail. You, yes you, 
can get a sheet of 20 stamps of the OSIRIS-REx capsule touching down, parachute deployed and all, in the Utah desert. You can make the day of every company you send a bill payment to with the reminder of this triumph of engineering and science. Or confuse your non-spacey relatives when you send them a card with a stamp. Or my favorite, simply delight the postal service workers when you go to the post office and request a booklet of the new space stamps. They'll be right next to the other 2023 class stamps, which include a commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Endangered Species Act and a tribute to the career of the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That's it for T-minus for September 27th, 2023. For additional resources from today's report, check out our show notes at space.n2k.com. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at space at n2k.com or submit the survey in the show notes. Your feedback ensures that we deliver the information that keeps you a step ahead in the rapidly changing space industry. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. This episode was produced by Alice Caruth. Mixing by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester, with original music and sound design by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Brandon Karp. Our chief intelligence officer is Eric Tillman. And I'm Maria Varmazis. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.